Hello class and welcome back to Physical Geology and today I want to go over the seafloor spreading lab. This lab is going to focus on paleomagnetism or using Earth's magnetic field. So basically think of this idea of paleomagnetism as a remnant magnetization found in rocks. Earth has a magnetic field and lavas like basalt, when they erupt, they have magnetic minerals called magnetite. And the little magnetite minerals, they're in the lava. And when the lava is molten, the little magnetic minerals are like little compass needles. They can move around and they point to where, wherever magnetic north is at the time these lavas erupted. And then once the lava is cool below 500 and 530 degrees centigrade, which is a, the Curie point, then the magnetism is locked in and it, it's like it becomes a permanent record. And then as, as a seafloor starts spreading, plate tectonics takes over, this material moves away from the mid-oceanic ridges. And what we find is that the seafloor is older, farther from the ridge, younger at the ridge. So the seafloor is going to spread in both directions. So here we have the East Pacific Rise, a very important mid-oceanic ridge. Note that this East Pacific Rise comes right into the Gulf of California it really becomes a San Andreas transform. Then it, when it leaves over here in Northern California near Point Arena, it becomes the Juan de Fuca and Gorda ridges, ridges up here in, off of Oregon, Washington, and Northern California. And then the other important mid-oceanic ridge is the mid-Atlantic ridge, where the seafloor is spreading directly away from this ridge. North America and Africa are getting farther apart over time. So anyways, you can read about this a little bit. Mostly I want to kind of show you some instructions as to how to work through this lab. And now uh, when we look at seafloor spreading paleomagnetism, the way we record these ages of the seafloor or the magnetic signatures is by showing dark areas which represent normal polarity. Like today, when you have a compass, your magnetic, the compass needle points toward the geographic north, somewhere up toward the North Pole, magnetic north. So in other words, Magnetic, magnetic north today coincides with, with a geographic north, or it's pretty close to it, it's a little bit off. But where there are white areas, those are areas of reverse polarity. So when these lavas erupted, the magnetic minerals were pointing toward the southern hemisphere or toward the south geographic pole, which means magnetic north during this time, when these lavas erupted, was magnetic north was down near the south geographic pole. One thing to get straight is the poles, the geographic poles don't change. What's fluctuating is the magnetic poles. The magnetic field can flip around. And that's what the seafloor has shown us. It shows the seafloor has reversed many times. It's been normal polarity, reverse polarity, normal, reverse. And you can see that uh, the duration of each polarity cycle varies over time. And they're like little fingerprints. You can match for example, these three, you got a, a really thin one in the middle and two relatively thin ones next to it. You can find those same pattern over here, right? So you find that same really thin one here, they label it C. So it's a mirror image. So in other words, when these lavas that letter C erupted, they were both at this mid-oceanic ridge. In other words, the two continents were closer together at that time. And since that time, they've spread, gotten farther apart and new seafloor has formed in the meantime. So that's the whole idea about seafloor spreading. When you look at this question, you, they're pretty straightforward. Is the seafloor older at C or at W? So remember, at the farther you get from the ridge, the older the seafloor. So obviously, W would be older. And then why are these bands, you know, the, the two bands at C, why are they equally distant from the ridge axis? And even the two W bands, they're about equally distant from the mid-oceanic ridge. That just means that when the lavas at W, when they erupted, both these Ws were at the ridge and the continents are really close together. You'd have to kind of reverse them, bring them closer together. And then the seafloor split in two, one W, in fact, they're called isochrons. One isochron has moved toward the west. The other isochron has moved toward the east, right? So remember, the, these lines of equal ages on the seafloor are called isochrons. We'll get back to those in a little bit. So they're equal distance because they formed together at the middle, like, like twins, and then they're separated by seafloor spreading over time. Here we're going to look at this, these two figures showing the ocean looked like, or, this, or these two continents, that start, they start breaking up at time A, and then later on as seafloor has, has progressed. So here they're closer together. So W is closer to the ridge. And over time, W is now farther from the ridge, right? One important 
thing to note here is the scale because we're going to be measuring the distances from the band at C, the isochron at C, back to the ridge axis and the isochron at W back to the ridge axis because we're going to try to figure out the rates of spreading and the ages of these different units. So for number four, can any sediment be on the new sea floor at the mid-oceanic ridge? Well, there could be a little bit, yes, but really it's not going to be very thick. And, and for the most case, there shouldn't be very many, very much sediment there at all because it's brand new sea floor. It's just erupted. It hasn't had time to accumulate that much sediment. So you want to say something to that effect there. Why would the thickness of the marine sediment be expected to increase away from the ridge axis in the direction of the continent? So if you look at the sediment, you can see there's hardly any sediment here at the ridge axis. You mostly see the basalt lavas there. But as you move toward the continent, you see the thickness becomes thicker, thicker, thicker. Then it becomes really thick right at the edge of the continents here, right? So what's happening here is, remember, the rivers and winds are bringing sediment, terrigenous sediment, from the land to the ocean. And so it's piling up near the shoreline and accumulating in this region here. And then as you move farther toward the seafloor, remember, it's younger here and it hasn't had as much time to collect sediment. So this is older over here has more time to collect sediment so it's thicker. So that's another way to think about it. Younger, younger seafloor will have thinner sediment, older seafloor will have thicker sediment. So when we're looking at problem number six, they give us the age of C and C is 10 million years old. So, so that's one of our isochron. And the isochron at C, let's highlight it, it's telling us that it's 10 million years old. So 10 million years ago, C was at the ridge axis and in that time they spread to their current position. Now, our job is to figure out the rate. So remember, rate is going to be some distance over time. And so we have the time, which is 10 million years. And all we got to figure out is this distance. So we need to measure from this ridge axis out to letter C. So we'll either measure this direction or this direction. And here's where we'll need some sort of ruler. And note that one millimeter is 50 kilometers here. So when we put our ruler here. I got a big ruler, so I'm going to start over here at 20 here. So I'm going to put my, my number 20 right at the ridge axis, right there. And I see when I move, move over to this letter C, I get about 8 millimeters. And same thing here, 8 millimeters. So for that distance, I'm covering 8 millimeters. And I know that it's 50 kilometers per millimeter. So we'll do 50 times 8. And that gives us 400 kilometers, right? Because now the millimeters cancel out, and my answer is going to be 400 kilometers. So the distance from the ridge axis out to the isochron at C is 400 kilometers. So our rate is going to be 400 divided by 10 million. But note that they also want us to do it in centimeters per year here, right? So we have the years. So we need to convert the 400 kilometers into centimeters. So to convert this, we take the 400 and we're going to have to multiply this by, we know that there's 1,000 meters per kilometer, right? We'll multiply that. So that's going to get rid of our kilometers and we'll have meters. Then we'll have to multiply that by 100 centimeters per meter. And the meters will cancel out and our answer will be in centimeters. So in the end, you'll, you'll see that this is going to be 40 million centimeters. 40 million centimeters. Because I get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 0. So Six, seven zeros, yeah. So that gives me 40 million centimeters. So the rate is gonna be 40 million centimeters divided by 10 million years. So this is a pretty easy, easy problem. It's just 40 divided by 10, which is gonna be four centimeters per year. That's our answer, four centimeters per year. All right, so keep keeping that in mind, we're gonna use that. So. Uh, the rate of spreading is 4 centimeters per year, and we're going to use that rate to figure out what the age of W is, right? So now we know rate is distance over time, so now time must be the distance over the rate. And we've already calculated the rate, which is 4 centimeters per year. Uh, but in this case, since we're going to be measuring things in kilometers, let's, let's make our rate what we had earlier, which was the 400 kilometers in 10 million years because that's what initially we weigh 10 million years and 400 kilometers here right so we'll do it that way uh, that way we'll, we'll get our answers in millions of years instead of in, in years here 
And so in this case, we're going to measure the distance from the ridge axis out to W. So the same idea, I'm going to put this right in the middle here. And I see out to W, I get 10. So remember, each, each centimeter is 10 millimeters. So I have 10, 20, 30, about 32 millimeters there, and about 33. So maybe I'm looking at 33 millimeters. Yeah, 33. So it's 33 millimeters. And so remember, each millimeter is 50 kilometers. So we'll take our 33 millimeters, and we're going to multiply it by our 50 kilometers per millimeter and that's gonna give us our distance in kilometers, right? And so let's do that. And that gives us 1650 kilometers, right? So now we can solve our problem. So in this case, our uh, the time, it's gonna be in million years, is gonna be the 1650 kilometers divided by the 400 kilometers per million year. And so when we do this, we, um, uh, the kilometers cancel out basically and we're going to get in fact we'll do 1650 we have to full, full multiply by 10 million 10 there and then we're going to divide by 400 and it gives us 41.25 so we'll just make it 41 ma so the age of the isochron at w is 41 million years and so now for this one we'll we'll darken in our isochron here make that 41 million years and then also this one's going to be at 41 million years so that's what i want you to do for for this one and i'm showing you this because later on we're going to do something very similar to this on on the map of the atlantic ocean which i've already taped for myself here you're going to be taping this as well um, and and you'll be measuring distances and figuring out rates and also time based on uh, distance over rate so keep this in mind, this is gonna come back a little bit later. And there is one more question that relates to these and we've already answered it. And if you look at the next page here, at the top here, question eight, is these dashed lines represent the, the isochrons, right? They represent these isochrons and they want you to label them. And, and, and we've done that already. So make sure you label the isochrons on the figure like we did here. So we've labeled isochrons with our appropriate ages here, okay. Now this next sec section deals with the verification of seafloor spreading and how this idea, this hypothesis of seafloor spreading was proposed in the er late 1950s, early 1960s. And then the scientific community got together to go and test it because it made a prediction. Basically the, the hypothesis says that the seafloor is younger at the ridge and older the farther you get away. And so that's what the, this whole project called the Deep Sea Drilling Project, DSTP. They went around the world drilling into the ocean floor, sampling the sediments and, and especially the microfossils, the plankton, right above the seafloor to try to get their ages, um, did the magnetic signature of the lavas and tried to figure out the age of the seafloor. Uh, the ship is called the Glomar Resolution. It's a, a deep sea drilling ship. It, had, it has a big tower here and, and it has these components that put, they put in the drill and they keep going on because literally they have to be on the ocean and go down two miles to reach the seafloor, then drill into the seafloor to pull out the sediment. So that's what this ship did really over the course of the 1960s and 1970s to get the age of the seafloor. And so the problem that we'll do next is this section B is we're going to be looking at those fossils that they've got from the drill cores and compare it to the paleomagnetic data and just and figure out the ages using both fossils and paleomagnetic signatures right and i'll show you how we do that so what i'm going to do i'm going to show you how to do questions or parts one two three and four so these are just kind of just directions they're not really questions but once we get to question five through nine these are questions that we'll deal with and so you'll have to come back and answer these and, and we'll come back and look at these in a little bit here. 